I'm Don Frederico, and this is Higher Callings. Malawi is a landlocked country in southeastern Africa. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. Like many countries, Malawi still applies the death penalty for capital crimes. Although the death penalty is no longer mandatory in capital cases and may be abolished entirely in Malawi soon. Several years ago, a law professor named Sandra Babcock took an interest in the Malawi penal system after seeing a New York Times article about horrific prison conditions there. Having spent much of her early career representing persons awaiting execution in American prisons, Professor Babcock, then at Northwestern Law School, arranged to bring six of her students to Malawi to see how they might help Malawian prisoners subjected to those conditions, many of whom had no lawyer and were still awaiting trial after years of incarceration. That first trip resulted in the release of 12 incarcerated persons and marked the beginning of a multi-year project Professor Babcock led, first at Northwestern and later at Cornell Law School. The following is a shortened version of the interview that begins with Professor Babcock's entry into academia following years of death penalty and public defender work and focuses on the important work she and her students have done in Malawi. The original version of the interview, which includes our conversation about how Professor Babcock became interested in the death penalty and about her earlier work in that arena, is also available at the podcast website and on the streaming platforms that carry the Higher Callings podcast. Now, at some point, you decided to go into academia. So what what drove you into uh, the ivory tower? <laughs> I know you're you're as far from the ivory tower as most as any professor could be, probably with the work you do. But what drove you into uh, teaching? You know, I, I kind of wanted to get back to my human rights practice. Um, I wanted to do more than uh, than death penalty work. I was interested in, in a number of different human rights violations. Um, I was interested in teaching and working with students. So it um, it was a natural it was a natural follow on from from the work that I'd been doing before. And I'd practiced for fifteen years at that time. So I felt like I had a lot to bring to yeah. to clinical teaching in particular. Right, and um, teaching students to do the type of work that you were already doing. Uh, so you can have a much greater impact, right? When you're actually equipping other people to go out and do that good work that you've already done. Exactly, I mean, you get to an age where you're like, okay, I have to start passing the baton. You know, I have yeah. to start, yeah, equipping others so that they can carry on the work. Right. And, um, and I think that for the last 10 years, especially of my career, I've really been focused on trying to equip lawyers and students with with these tools and resources and knowledge uh, so that they can that they can continue the work and 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 do better and do more and that is really rewarding it, it is just the best experience you know, any anybody who teaches will tell you at any level you know from probably elementary school to through universities is that you know when you find those students who just soak up the knowledge and then you know go out into the world and do amazing things and you know that you had an influence on them that's just the best thing so now you were a clinical professor at northwestern and and um what clinics were you running at the time or did you found at the time i ran the international human rights clinic there okay uh, which is the same clinic that i run here at um at cornell and um, and the very first project that I started at uh, Northwestern when I began teaching was uh, a project looking at and, and assisting prisoners who were potentially facing the death penalty in Malawi. Yeah, and that's the first time I think I heard about the work you do. I heard about the work you've done with respect to the death penalty in Malawi, and I just became very interested in it. I was not at all familiar with the country of Malawi, which is on the east coast of Africa. I don't know if that's what you call it, um, uh, 
uh, or if there's a better descriptor. But you started doing that work at Northwestern, and what specifically were you were you doing there? Well, we we started off. Um, you know, I, I I was interested in Malawi because at the time I moved into clinical teaching, there was a front page story in the New York Times about prison overcrowding in Malawi. Uh, and there was a, a color photo, an above the fold color photo. This is when you know people actually got a physical paper. And the photograph showed men who were stacked like firewood in a prison cell um, with you know scarcely a millimeter of space between them. They were just so, so tightly wedged in. Um, and they were sleeping head to foot. Um, and the when I read, the article, the photo itself was just so stunning. Um, and when I read the article that accompanied it, it said that um, that the prison overcrowding in Malawi was so was so bad that they could only sleep this way, and that if they wanted to turn over in their sleep, somebody in the middle of the night would give a signal, and everybody would turn simultaneously. Mm. Um, you know, it went on to describe in great detail the, you know, the horrifying conditions, the lack of sanitary facilities. And um, but in the same article, uh, they mentioned that there were paralegals who were going into the prisons and teaching prisoners about their rights to, you know, help them advocate for themselves in court, because many people in Malawi don't have lawyers. Most people don't have lawyers. Um, and I thought, well, if, you know, if they're letting paralegals into prisons, maybe they'll let students into prisons. So that was the first, um, that was the reason why I, I thought about Malawi. It was just because of that New York Times article. And incidentally, that same photograph, there's a connection to Brian Stevenson, that photograph that, that I saw that really, you know, inspired me and really transformed my career um, is now in the, the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and it accompanies an exhibit that discusses the, um, the, the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, and how um, Africans were brought to this country in the holds of ships in these, you know, torturous conditions. And the photograph that they have used in that exhibit is that same photograph of the Malawian prison. Hmm. That's how powerful that photo was. Yeah. And and so how did you uh, get started? I mean, what, who did you contact? How did you get going on a project like that? Well, it turns out that the a colleague of mine at Northwestern knew somebody who worked in Malawi. Mm -hmm. um, he worked at an organization called Penal Reform International, which still exists. It's a terrific organization. Uh, and they were doing work in the prisons with paralegals. So I contacted this guy, his name was Adam Stapleton, and told him that I wanted to bring some students over there. Northwestern wouldn't pay for that, so I had to, to fundraise. Um, I did some, some fee generating work for the Mexican government, and I managed to bring in enough money to pay for the students' trips, and I brought a group of students over, um, and that was the first, the very first of, I think I now I've been back 25 times to Malawi. Wow. Um, and I've brought probably around 100 students. But that first trip was, you know, six students. And we, um, you know, we went into the prisons. We started interviewing prisoners, finding out why they were there. Uh, what were they accused of? Had they ever been to court? Um, I sent some students to the prosecutor's office to track down their files. And we were able in that very first trip, which was only a two week trip, we got 12 people out of prison. And that was because we, we adopted um, an approach that you would just never think of wouldn't be feasible here, where we were able by sort of bringing the prosecution and the defense together and talking about the circumstances of these cases um, we were able to work out agreements, basically plea agreements, mm -hmm. but to do it in a really kind of a non-adversarial setting. And the prosecution ended up agreeing that these were people who didn't deserve to be in prison. And so were these people who had were waiting trial? They had not they were yet been convicted? Trial. Okay. 
they were awaiting trial. So when we first started going the first five years or so, we all we all we did is work on pretrial detention. Okay. Um, we helped people prepare for trials. We helped, you know, we helped find lost people in the prison yeah. who had just been sitting there for years and years without access to the courts. So at that time, you were focused on sort of the human rights aspect and the, I guess we would call it the civil rights or prisoner mm -hmm. rights, um, motivated at first by what you saw about the conditions that prisoners were under. But it sounds like it wasn't initially focused on the death penalty. Is that is that right? That's right. I mean, a lot of the cases were, you know, Malawi at the time had what we call a mandatory death penalty. So anyone who was convicted of certain crimes, murder, treason, um, would automatically be sentenced to death without any regard for their age, their mental health, um, you know, whether they'd been abused as a child, none of this was relevant. Um, many of the cases that we worked on were people who had been charged with homicides. So if they had gone to trial, they would have faced capital sentences. Yeah. Um, but we also represented other people. You know, there was a, a woman that we represented who we, we just saw her when we were in the prison. She was very pregnant. Um, and it turns out she was pregnant with twins. When we talked to her about why she was in prison, it turns out she had had a, a consensual relationship with her half brother, whom she had never met as a child. She met him as an adult. They fell in love um, and they started a relationship. And in fact, you know, she, they, she became pregnant. Um, and this was against the law. So even though her traditional leader in her village had blessed the union, had given his approval, um, her, an ex-partner of hers informed the police and they arrested her and they arrested her partner. So at the time that we saw her, she'd been in prison for six months for this crime. It was a, you know, almost, almost a status offense. Um, she was about to give birth. She had another child in prison with her. She'd never been to court. She didn't have a lawyer. Uh, so we went to the prosecutor's office and went to the judge um, and advocated for her. And so there is just there is just no need for her to be in prison. And they ultimately agreed. So we were able to get her out and we got her brother out. Um, so there were little things like that, too. You know, we we were just there and we, you know, we learned by doing. And we would find, you know, situations and work with people to try to resolve them. So you were a group of Americans um, who went to Africa and went to Malawi in particular to do this work. Where, what was the status of the bar in Malawi? I, you know, as I understand it, Malawi was, uh, had been a colony of Great Britain and um, uh, their legal system wasn't that different from what we're used to. I assume they had right to jury trial, just like they do in in Britain and they do here in the United States. Um, so it was not a totally alien environment to go work in that country for American lawyers and American law students. But where were the lawyers uh, and the judges? Um, in Malawi at the time? Why did it take some group coming in from another country to start to see results for some of these people? You know, it's um, it really comes down to a question of, of resources um, and capacity. At the time, um, and I think this is probably still the case, you know, Malawi has one law, one law school uh, that was accredited it graduates about 30 people a year um, on a good year. And, you know, at the time we started doing this, there were about 300 lawyers throughout the whole country. What's the population like in Malawi? Well, now it's close to 20 million. Okay. At the time, it was probably about 13 million. Um, and in terms of legal aid lawyers, there were no more than a handful. At any given time, there could be as few as seven and as many as 20. But, you know, on average, I'd say there's about 10 legal aid lawyers in the entire country, and they do all civil legal aid and all criminal legal aid. They simply don't have, you know, the capacity 
to provide quality legal representation to every person who needs it. And you're talking about a country where, you know, 99% of the population is indigent. Um, you know, Ma Malawi is the, you know, by some estimates, the sixth poorest country in the world. Oh. Um, so even in the spectrum of countries in the global south that suffer terrible poverty, Malawi is at the very bottom. Okay. Um, the It's hard for people, you know, for people who've never been there to try to communicate how deprived um, people are and even professionals who, who work as lawyers. Um, but to give you an idea, you know, because you ask about like, where were the lawyers? Why weren't they doing this? People wouldn't go to the prison to visit their clients because number one, they have no vehicles. They don't have cars, right? Wow. So how do you get there? You have to have like a, maybe a company car or something. But there are terrible, first of all, there are terrible fuel shortages in Malawi. Right now, if you go to Malawi, there's a fuel shortage. You can't, you know, people are lining up to get gas um, 24 hours in advance because fuel is so scarce. But even if you, even if there is fuel available, people can't afford it. Um, so even just, you know, a simple thing like going to the prison to interview someone becomes an insurmountable, you know, task because you just don't have the ability to do it. Copying a, a legal document, you know, you want to file something with the court in Malawi at the time and still to this day, they don't have electronic filing. You have to file a paper copy. Um, to try to get something copied in Malawi, first of all, to get it printed and then to yeah. get it copied. I remember once going to three different copy places, you know, little shops, tiny little shops. These aren't Kinko's, you know, these are like little hole in the wall places that have a copy machine, you know, and the first one I'd go to the copy machine wasn't working. The second one, there was a power outage. So, you know, nothing was working. You know, the third one, they had to download the software and then they could get the copies, but they were terrible. You know, like literally everything is difficult and everything takes time. And so, you know, for people who don't have the backing of a university, um, who don't have, I, I ended up, I would bring a portable printer with me when I went every single time um, because I couldn't rely on getting copies anywhere. Sure. Um, so it's just all of these little things that add up. Um, and, and on top of that, when, you know, we started working on the cases of prisoners who'd been sentenced to death many years ago, in many cases, their files had been lost. There was no filing system. So people would have these paper files that in like in one court, the filing system was an abandoned toilet cubicle, you know, and even in the National Archives, things would be in boxes, but they wouldn't be in any particular order. And, and so even finding the file of somebody who, let's say, who has been in prison for five years becomes really challenging. And so there are people literally in prison in Malawi whose files are missing. There's really no record of the evidence against them. Um, and, you know, and yet they remain in custody. It, it sounds like your biggest obstacle in helping these people was the lack of resources. In other words, here, depending on where in this country you, you would be, you might find strong political opposition to what you were doing. Uh, or, you know, just uh, prosecutors who uh, wouldn't cooperate, wouldn't talk to you, wouldn't provide you the information you were entitled to. Did you find any of that in Malawi or was it really more just uh, the lack of resources to make sure that files weren't lost and copies could be made and, and all those things that we take for granted here? It, that's really what it was. I mean, when we, I mean, Malawi is, is such an extraordinary place. You know, you have a lot of really creative um, people in the legal profession, um, committed people, passionate, smart, um, and, you know, but, but they just don't have the, the tools and the resources. Um, and so it's, a, it, you know, but at the same time, you have things we were talking about, the death penalty in the United States and, you know, how we believe in redemption. Well, the idea of redemption that, you know, people can change is really kind of an accepted principle in the criminal justice system in Malawi. You know, judges will, you know, routinely accord great mitigating weight 
to someone who is below the age of 25 um, at the time of the crime because they know that people can change. Uh, and similarly, let's say you have somebody who is, you know, very elderly and, you know, you're making a pitch for compassionate release. That's something that people will be very sensitive to. Um, they really, um, they really take that to heart. And there are ways in which, and, and same thing you asked about sort of the adversarial system and prosecutors withholding evidence that does not happen in Malawi. As I've seen, look, maybe it does. I've never seen it. Um, prosecutors struggle the same ways that defense attorneys do. They have it a little easier because the police support the prosecutors and so police will do investigation, whereas legal aid lawyers, they have no investigators, they have no experts, they've got nothing. So prosecutors have it a little easier, but they're not, you know, if they don't provide paperwork, it's because they don't have the paperwork or they don't have the resources to make a copy of the file for the defense. It's not that they're willfully hiding exculpatory evidence. I've right. never seen that in Malawi. Or resisting uh, having to produce it through court right. motions or something right. like that. Which doesn't mean that the effects aren't equally pernicious for the accused person, you know, who is sitting in prison and who doesn't, you know, who's, who's never been shown an iota of evidence, right? Um, and who's sitting there for five years awaiting trial without access to the courts. But there's not venality behind it. Um, right. And that is a real difference. Um, the other thing I noticed from the very beginning is that when you walk into a prison in Malawi, um, there might be, you know, as a foreigner, there was some initial suspicion. And, you know, I really had to go back a number of times and, you know, speak a little bit of Chichewa and, you know, establish my bona fides. But once we did that, um, the prison welcomed us. The prison recognized that there were people there who didn't belong there. And the most extraordinary thing was once we, you know, started working on capital cases and people started to get out of prison after having been there for 20 years, the prison guards would celebrate with us. They were happy for people to be released. Wow. And this was something I had never experienced in a U.S. prison. Yeah. Yeah. Which is not to say there aren't guards in U.S. prisons that wouldn't have been happy too. Um, but... It sounds like the culture overall is That's different. That's the there. thing. It's the culture. It's not about the individuals. Of course, right. there's going to be, you know, violent um, prison guards and, you know, any place you go. The, it just all depends on the culture. But the culture, and I'm not saying that in Malawi there's never violence um, in the prisons, you know, by prison guards. But you don't, it's not as, as tangible. Like the, the, there's not that tense um you know, really oppressive atmosphere. It's oppressive because people aren't eating enough. You know, they don't have enough food, mm -hmm. um, horrible sleeping conditions. The conditions are God awful. But at the same time, they're treated with a degree of humanity that you just don't see yeah. in the US. I have danced in prisons in Malawi repeatedly with prisoners. And- You mean when they're released or when they- No, in the prison, released? Okay. inside the prisons. You know, there are different, dance groups in the prisons. Um, and I have danced with some of my clients in the prison, um, in the view of prison officers. Um, and this is, you know, I'm, I just can't imagine doing that. Uh, it would never, ever happen in the United States. You know, people aren't really allowed to be fully human in U.S. prisons. So, um, you in a was it 2014 you left northwestern and you went to cornell law school mm -hmm. is that when it happened and um and you continued to work in malawi at cornell tell us how that work has gone i mean what were you doing the same things or i know that there had been some changes in the law in malawi at some point in time which affected your work. Can you tell us about that transition to Cornell and, and what you've done since then? Sure. So um, around the time I started working in Malawi, um, the Malawi High Court determined that the mandatory death penalty violated the Malawian constitution. What that meant was that everyone 
on death row who had received this, what it's like an automatic death sentence, like I described before, without consideration of the circumstances of the crime or their personal backgrounds, was entitled to a new sentencing proceeding. But because of all of the resource constraints that I mentioned before, um, several years went by after this decision, it was in 2007, and everyone who'd been sentenced to death was still sitting in prison and nobody had taken those cases to court. So, you know, starting slightly, shortly before I came to Cornell, um, I went to the prisons in, in Malawi and started to interview the prisoners who were there with my students um, to talk to prosecutors, judges, and others about, you know, how it is that these cases could be brought back for resentencing. We began training people in how to conduct a mitigation investigation, which had never been done before in Malawi um, because mitigation evidence wasn't relevant. So we had to teach people about things like intellectual disability. What is intellectual disability? How do you measure intellectual disability um, in a country where no one has ever done research on intellectual disability? It's all been done in the global north, right? So we had to find a nonverbal screening test for intellectual dis disability that can be used on people who aren't literate. Um, and we had to bring in experts to train people in how do you, you know, do these kinds of mental health screenings. Because of course, intellectual disability is not only a relevant mitigating factor, but it in fact, it, you know, it should exclude someone from the application of the death penalty under international law. Um, so all of this, you know, groundwork took, took years. And then when I came to Cornell, um, we had finally gotten to the point where the courts and the prosecution and the defense were trained and they were ready to start hearing these cases. Um, and we had applied for a, a grant that we received that would allow for, you know, sort of basic expenses so for people to drive to court, um, to get the prisoners there, to provide people with the lunches so they'd have something to eat. Again, all these basic things you just wouldn't think about in the States that were obstacles to, the, to, to them accessing uh, justice. And at Cornell, it was uh, the first hearing started taking place. My students um, here at Cornell were writing these um, uh, submissions to the court seeking reduced sentences for prisoners who had been on death row for you know, 20 years, um, who'd been you know, sentenced decades earlier, sometimes for crimes they didn't commit. There were some people who we believed were, were factually innocent. Um, there were others where the circumstances were so highly mitigating. Um, you know, someone who killed his stepfather who'd been beating his mother. Um, a woman who killed her husband who'd been beating her and her mother. Um, you know, these were very, you know, the kinds of cases you would never ever see prosecuted in this country as death penalty cases. Um, and we started to advocate for them. And, and my students wrote the legal submissions that went to the courts that presented all the mitigating evidence um, and sought a reduction in their in their sentences. And those hearings began and they 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 happened for years. And um, and my students were involved, really heavily involved in not only the mitigation investigations that we did, but um, you know, going to the prisons and talking to the prisoners and then putting this all together so that the courts could take it into account. Um, the first prisoners were released in uh, early 2015. This was my very first semester teaching at Cornell. So, um, so uh, let me just stop you there. You said they were released. So it wasn't just a change in their sentences, but they were actually let go. Well, so it was a change in their sentences. What, what would happen is they would be resentenced to, let's say, a term of years. Um, and if they were given a 20 year sentence and they had already served 20 years or even right. 15, because, you know, we have in this country and they have there a system where you get credit for, for good time and for good behavior. Um, so they would be reduced to a term of years and then people who had already served that sentence would be released. Uh, and that's what happened. Um, so a lot of people were released. The first person to be released was a was a woman um, who had been in prison for for several years, and um, 
And then it just started happening every month. People would be released. Um, and we got to witness some of these releases. I took students there. We were there when clients walked out of prison, um, you know, which is a rare experience for any lawyer. But we ultimately were able to get 150 former death row prisoners um, released and they are back in their villages. Um, they are living full lives. They've had children. They have, you know, they're working. Um, it was really, really extraordinary. That That is, that's just amazing. I mean, 150 uh, people who thought that they were going to die and they've been given a new life, all of them. That's just wonderful work. And again, going back to the theme you and I both agree on, I'm not sure everybody does, that everybody um, can be redeemed, that nobody is the, the worst thing that they've done in their life. You, you can't reduce somebody to that. Um, and presumably, maybe some of these people weren't guilty of the crimes at all. Um, but your job was really to get the sentences changed, and they were released that way. That's right. And I think the other thing that's worth pointing out is that this was a real innovation in Malawi that I learned from. I didn't come up with this idea. The paralegals came up with this idea, the Malawian paralegals. In every single case where someone was released, we went to the village. Um, and I say we, I only went to a couple of villages. The paralegals went to every single village. Um, some of these villages were so far away from main roads. You know, they would take, they would travel for a day to get to these villages and they would explain to the villagers what was happening in these cases. They would explain that they were going back to court. They would speak to the victim's family members. They would speak to the village, um, to the traditional leaders, you know, the village chiefs to say, um, you know, we're going to court. This is why. This is what we're trying to do. There's a possibility that this person would be coming back to live in your community. Would that be acceptable to you? Um, and they got feedback from the villagers about how they felt about that. Nine times out of 10, the village said, um, it, you know, this was very difficult for us, but it was not only difficult that a life was lost, um, it was difficult for us to lose, you know, a, a community member, um, to lose a husband, to lose a father, um, because most of them, of course, were men. But what we were really struck by was people's willingness to, to forgive. And if not to forgive, to understand that people could change. Um, and, and the, the fabric of village life in Malawi is such that, you know, when you lose an able-bodied adult, you know, you lose somebody who's able to help rebuild a school, you know, who's able to dig a grave, who's able to repair a road, because all of these things, they don't get done by the state. You know, villagers have to do it themselves. So they mourned the loss, not only of the victim of the crime, but of the person who was condemned to die. And in many cases, until we went to the village, they didn't even know that the prisoner was still alive. This, I'm going to ask you a question, the answer to which might be very obvious, but maybe not. What do the students get out of this work? I'm sure many of them get a lot of personal satisfaction, but I'm sure there's more to it than that, too. Yeah, it's. Um, I think it blows their mind. You know, I think it really blows their mind when they when they go to Malawi um, and they recognize not only that, you know, I think for the, the first impression is just of overwhelming po poverty, right? You know, sort of the poverty and, um, and deprivation, which, which is overwhelming if you've never been exposed to it before. But I think the second thing that they recognize is that they have the power to affect change in a country that is, you know, halfway around the world, um, you know, where there are immense uh, cultural differences. And yet they see that because they have certain talents, because they have resources behind them and, you know, from Cornell University, um, 
they have access to legal databases, they have legal training, they have access to copy machines and, you know, filing cabinets and Westlaw, um, that they have something that is really valuable. Um, and that, you know, by using those skills, and by, you know, using the skills that we teach them in the clinic, which is about, you know, how do you, how do you listen to someone? How do you engage in active listening? How do you, how do you listen empathetically? Um, and going into prisons and, and listening to people tell their stories to someone for the very, very first time. And the very first person who is hearing the story of a Malawian prisoner is an American law student, you know, from Ithaca. Um, there's something that is very powerful about that experience, because I think that, you know, most students in law school, they just, you know, they don't see how they can, I, I, I think they don't, it's really hard for them to grasp how they can um, make a difference in someone's life as a lawyer, you know, not as an individual, but as a lawyer. And this is, this teaches that, um, you know, if you can do it in Malawi, <laughs> you you can do it in, you know, in your neighborhood. It um, teaches it in a very dramatic way. I mean, it, yeah. it's a, it's an enormous difference. And so it's the difference between life and death. Yeah. And um, yeah, if, if you can do that, then there are other ways you can make a difference in other people's lives too. Anything is possible, I guess. Anything is, part is of what possible. They learn. And they develop the skills that translate into all types of legal work. You mentioned listening. I think listening is just such an important skill for any lawyer to have, but particularly litigators, people who are doing either civil or criminal litigation. No so that, that's just wonderful. Now, now, you've been doing it long enough that you've seen some of your students go off into their careers. Are any of them continuing to do this kind of work after they graduate? They are. Um... You know, some of them as pro bono lawyers at firms, uh, but some of them have gone on to be public defenders and um, others are doing death penalty defense work. Others are doing human rights work um, in different countries around the world and in the United States. Um, so it's, um, and, and I stay in touch with them, you know, not, not every single one, but I stay in touch with a lot of them and I update them on the cases, you know, when we have news I have a Malawi newsletter. I send everybody updates and keep them informed. And, um, you know, my first students that I had, you know, as a young law professor are, must be close to 40 years old now, you know, which is hard to fathom. Right. Um, but, you know, I think the other thing that Malawi, the Malawi work teaches them is that because all of the students who are on the Malawi project, I, I have two students who are on the Malawi project now, whom I took to Malawi in November, um, they know that they are part of, you know, they're the latest generation of students that have been going to Malawi, you know, for 15 years. And it also helps them to see that you can have incredible results. You can affect change, but change takes time. It takes an investment of, you know, time and humility and, um, you know, a willingness to, you know, to learn and um, to work within a, a different system and to bring people along. And all of that just takes takes years, you know. And it, it's right. we've been in Malawi 15 years now. And, you know, they are, it looks like, on the brink of abolishing the death penalty. 15 years is a, is a blink of an eye, right? But for students, it's an, an unimaginably long time, right? Yes. And it teaches them that, like, you know, you just do this patient, deliberate work and you keep going back and you build the relationships and you keep plugging away and, you know, and you can get things done. And sometimes you have immediate results. Like the first trip we went, we got 12 people out of prison. Like that's pretty extraordinary. Yeah. Um, but the long term, you know, the, the more enduring transformation of a legal culture, you know, training a generation of lawyers to do things differently, you know, the importance of visiting a client in prison, you know, a really basic thing. Um, when we first started going to Malawi, we would go into the prison and we'd have to sit on the floor because they wouldn't give our clients chairs. Um, and it used to be that when lawyers went into prisons and paralegals too, they would sit on a chair and the client would sit on the floor. And so you would be in this position of superiority to the client. So I told the students, no, we're not going to do that. 
if the prison doesn't give them chairs, everybody sits on the floor. So we went in, nobody wanted to do it, like nobody wanted to do this, right? The paralegal said, we're not going to do it. We're wearing nice suits. We don't want to sit on the floor. You know, the lawyers certainly didn't want to do it, but they humored me and we went into the prison. Everybody sat on the floor and it was so upsetting for the prison staff to see these lawyers and, you know, everybody sitting on the floor that they gave chairs to everybody. Wow. And now everyone gets chairs every time. It's not questioned. And that's just a tiny little example, but it's it's recognizing the humanity of the people who are in prison. So that, to me alone, like just for the students to be able to see that, like yeah. just by asking for something and going back and, okay, you're not going to give me a chair, then I'm sitting on the floor. It's almost like passive resistance, right? And then it affects It sounds me. a lot like it, yeah. yeah. But the outcome was, was great. Um, well, so you, you've done, you've been doing and you're still doing the work in Malawi. Now, I understand you've also expanded some of that work to Tanzania. What are you That's, doing there? We're, so in Tanzania, we're doing much of the same. Um, we've shifted recently and, you know, the Cornell Center and the death penalty worldwide um, has become a real leader in looking at gender bias in the application of the death penalty. Um, and that's something I'm very passionate about. Um, so the people that we are now representing in Tanzania, many of them are women. Many of them have been subjected to violence by intimate partners, family members, um, and are in prison because of their uh, responses to that violence. So we are uh, working with local partners um, in those countries. We're also doing a lot of work before the African Court on Human and People's Rights to um, to try to obtain jurisprudence that is um, going to hopefully um, bring African countries closer to abolishing the death penalty um, and protect more and more people uh, from execution. So we are bringing with the, and the students are very involved in bringing these cases to the African court. Um, so we're we're doing a lot of the same work, but just it's slightly different because it's a new country, it's a different context, um, but it's still very very challenging and very satisfying. Now, while you're doing all of this really important work in Africa and your students also, um, you're part of a larger group of professors at Cornell, who and the and the others, as I understand it, are doing. The same kind of work, a very similar work, domestically in the United States, um, and there, Cornell is known, I think, not only for the death penalty project worldwide, but for the death penalty project that's run at Cornell um, by such professors as John Bloom and Sherry Lynn Johnson and Keir Weibel. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. I um, and. Uh, all of whom I know are just phenomenal uh, professors and also people who have argued important cases and worked uh, with the help of students and others to get people in the United States off of death row. I know uh, I actually heard Sherry Lynn Johnson speak at a program that Cornell uh, had last week in New York City. Um, and I was reminded that she had won the case in the Supreme Court just a few years ago, Flowers versus Mississippi, which involved, I won't go into all the details, but um, it involved a black man who was accused of murder, tried repeatedly and, and found guilty, but the, the appellate court in Mississippi, I think more than once, reversed the conviction because the prosecutor um, had been challenging the black jurors who were being impaneled um, and getting them excluded, or at least many of them excluded from sitting on the trial. Um, so there was a racial discrimination, racial bias factor um, that the state courts had um, found compelling and but ultimately, um, he in the last conviction, it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. He's out. 
they did get him out. Yeah. Sherry Lynn Johnson won that case in, yeah. this, in a conservative Supreme Court um, yeah. based on the racial bias of uh, and the actions of the prosecutor in excluding jurors. So just uh, amazing work. And I know John Bloom does, uh, Professor Bloom, who, you know, I don't even think I've ever met. He doesn't know who I am, I'm sure. But he has uh, quite a reputation uh, nationally and perhaps internationally in the work he's done in the United States. So you're part of this larger death penalty program at Cornell. Can you talk a little bit about how all of you work together, how you collaborate? Um, you know, I, I know you've won some awards together, some very prestigious awards. You also won a very prestigious award yourself from the American Bar Association a, a few years ago. Um, but tell me a little bit about sort of that culture among at least the four of you, and there's probably more that I'm leaving out. Well, I feel very lucky to work um, with Professors Bloom and Johnson and Weibel. They really are some of the most highly respected capital litigators and scholars in the country. You know, they've got it all. They're brilliant. They're incredible litigators, um, really humane people, just decent, wonderful human beings. Um, and it, in it, in what you say is true. I think Cornell has the strongest faculty um, who has, you know, made the deepest impact on the way that the death penalty is applied um, and restricting the way the death penalty is applied in this country um, of any law faculty in the country. There are lots of good people in law faculties around the country, but the concentration that we have at Cornell um, is is pretty remarkable. And, you know, I, I've kind of glossed over the fact that you all teach in the classroom, too. So um, there is a more scholarly side of this that we haven't talked about. But but this has been really uh, fascinating, Sandra, and uh, I really appreciate your spending the time on this. Where could people go to learn more? I know there's there are some things uh, that are up on the uh, Cornell Law School website. Um, well, I, you know, the first place is the Cornell um Center on the Death Penalty Worldwide, which is deathpenaltyworldwide.org. Um, and we are always looking for and can use donations, especially to help us pay the expenses of lawyers in Tanzania and Malawi. Um, we don't have a budget for that. We don't get a, a budget from the law school for that. Um, but there are, as I said, the needs are so great. Um, and the costs are so little compared to what we would pay here for lawyers. Yeah. Um, but we need to find people, we need to get people lawyers and we need, you know, psychologists to go to the prison and do these um, assessments. Um, so any, any donation really helps. And at our website, you can find uh, information on how to donate. Great. Well, thank you very much. I, this has been fascinating. And uh, again, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, so thank you and uh, thank keep you, up the good work. I know you will. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your interest and um, look forward to hearing it when it runs. Great. Take okay. care. Take care. Bye. Bye. This has been an episode of Higher Callings. Your host is Donald Federico. Music is provided by Fancy Mountain, and our logo was designed by Matt Pedro. The associate producer is Brian Federico. Higher Callings is a production of Federico Media, LLC.